Using emulation to write unpacking scripts is usually a great idea. Why? Firstly, it's safe. It does not run the Maverick code. Emulation is not the same as running it, so you can write static unpacking tools or scripts with it. Secondly, it can deal with change decoding and decryption algorithm to a certain extent. So usually when you write a static unpacker and the decryption process of the unpacking step changes, your unpacking script won't work anymore, right? But this doesn't happen if you use emulation because the emulation will take care of these changes. Certainly, for the same reason, your script might be shorter because you don't have to take care of every detail and how the unpacking step works. You don't even have to analyze every detail of the unpacking step. So even the process before that, the analysis might be significantly shorter. Let's take a look at the execution flow of the packer step that we are going to deal with. It has three stages. The first starts with an emulation detection. Then it continues to decrypt the next stage. The second stage performs run PE injection, also known as process hollowing. The third stage is the actual payload. I will be packing x32 dbg with it, because why not? It's an awesome tool. Now we will be dumping the packed target file at this stage. Why there? Shouldn't that be later? No, we do not have to wait until the injection happened to dump it. In fact, it is often easier if you do this earlier before the file has been mapped to memory because you do not have to deal with unmapping it again. When the second stage is decrypted, it does not only decrypt the code of stage two, but also decrypts the target file, which at this point resides in memory. The only thing we need to take care of before that is the emulation detection. We will be using API hooks in the emulator to do that. Today we will write an unpacking script that is based on emulation. For emulation, we will use Mendian's Speak Easy. Furthermore, to create a trainings sample, we will be using PEUnion Crypter to create a packed file. What is PEUnion? It's an open source crypto binder and downloader on GitHub. And we can apply run PE shellcode to 32 bit native files. That's what we are going to use. PUnion also has several anti emulation mechanisms, and we will defeat one of those with our script. So let's start by creating our file with PEUnion. So as a step, we have three different options. And today we deal with the native step. So there's only the 32-bit option for that one. And I chose x32dvg.exe as an icon. Now we go to the items node here, and that is where we apply different shell codes depending on what they shall do. The drop part is when you create a dropper, for run PE, you create a packed file that will use run PE to inject the packed target file. Invoke is only applicable for .NET and yeah, message box will basically just show a message. Let's use run PE here. In this case, we are choosing an embedded file. And we need to use the 32-bit executor. So I'm gonna leave it this way. Later on, we might have to adjust the script for other options like these, but let's for now just use the defaults. We save our project. And here we build the resulting executable. Just gonna call it packed. A 
And here we have our packed file. And the first thing to try is execute speak easy on the command line and see how far it gets. Minus T, I specify the target for emulation. And we can now see that it doesn't really execute anything that would be useful for run PE injection or unpacking for that matter. So uh, something doesn't seem to work right here. And the last call that was made before exit process is set error mode. So this is something we should be looking for in the code. And we can see here where the call is being made. So I'm going to use Visual Studio Code to write the unpacking script, calling it unpacker.py. So this is just a skeleton for now. This just asked for the path of the input file as a parameter. So we can now continue to work with that and test other samples with it easily. So how do we work with SpeakEasy? SpeakEasy is an example in the repository. We're gonna use that. So here are examples and there is UPX unpack. So this sounds like we could use this as a skeleton. Just the first part should be enough. So we've now written a class that we can modify to unpack things for us. I just have to fix something here. It's used output path, uh, an output path that's different from our current sample. So how do we use this now to run the emulation and get some output? First, we have to load the module. For the sample that we want to unpack. Then we run the module. And as a last step, we want to print some sort of report. So 
Speakeasy provides a JSON report for you. So we simply print the JSON in a prettified form to the command line, to the terminal. Let's now test this. Let's add a run configuration here. We want Python file with arguments. All right. So we're going to use this file per default when we press run. It's also print when we are done. And this doesn't look that pretty. Uh, I guess we have to add the indent. Let's take a look at this. It seems to me that this terminal here cuts off the rest of the data, which is suboptimal. So we still have to use the usual command line to see the actual output. Let's make a bigger one. Because now if we execute this here, we can see the calls that were made to set error mode and then exit process. Now the next step, we need to figure out why this happens, why it exits. So we are gonna open this sample in Ghidra. I'm going to switch to the light theme because it's better readable. So now we put the pack file inside. And we just go with the defaults. Also use the defaults for the analysis and wait until it's finished. Now, there are several ways we can figure out what's happening. In this instance, I would like to avoid diving too deep into the sample analysis because the, the purpose or the, the clear advantage of using emulation is that you don't have to know exactly how it works. You just go to the parts that don't work and then fix them, and uh, that's it. So let's look at this. We have here a hint that this is the last thing that is being executed, called in the Windows API. Let's go to this location. We say navigation, go to, we enter our address, and we are here. And just like in our case, we see two calls to set error mode. 
We can also see here what has been returned by the emulator. The first score was with set error mode, mode 400 and we returned zero. And in the second case, we set error mode to, we have set error mode call with zero and we returned zero. And right after that is a check if uvar1 is 400. So it seems to check if the set error mode call returns the last error that we set, which makes sense, right? But this isn't happening. So speak easy right here did not do that. It returned zero again. And that gave away that this sample is currently being emulated. And because of that, it refuses to run. After that, there are obviously more checks for the computer name and other stuff, which could also be anti-emulation calls, which is interesting. But we failed here, so let's fix this first. So how do we fix that? The way we do that is we set an API hook. That means we hook set error mode and define ourselves what this function returns. And we need to do that before we run our module. So this is a fixed definition for the parameters of a function that is used for hooking. Now we set the API hook for the correct API. And that is in kernel 32, set error mode. And what are we going to do to fix this? Well, we will now save the last error mode value and return that. We initialize the error mode value to zero. And it seems that this always returns the previous error. So this is what we're going to do here as well. And the new error mode is in the parameters of parents argument here at index zero. So this is always an array containing all of the parameters for the hooked function. And this will be using that to extract the argument. Let's see if that helped. Did I save? And now we see it worked. So we see very far more calls here. So here are all our set error mode calls. And now it seems to ace the other anti-emulation parts of the sample. Because here get computer name is called. We have a giveaway speak easy host as a computer name, but this is not part of the comparison checks. So these comparisons, are these seem to be also some emulation hosts, but speakeasy host is not one of them. So we ace that. It calls create thread here, then it calls load library A four times. So it dynamically resolves DLLs here and their imports probably as well. So the question is, did we get far enough that the resulting payload is already part of the memory? To figure that out, let's simply dump the memory at this point.
can use this as an example here. I think we did not save the base address as it is happening here. Let me just check where it gets it from. It says module get base. So we can say self load module. Let's provide the base here. So this just dumps all of the memory, so I, I'm going to rename it. And we do this after we ran the module. So let's try this. I'm just opening this uh, with, with the strings list thing here. And let's see if we find x64 dbg. And there it is, or x32 dbg in this instance. So this worked. But is there a way we can determine the exact location and size of this? A good candidate is virtual protect because here we can see it changes this to execute permissions and we do have the size here as well. So we could dump the location with this start address, this size, if we have a virtual protect call that sets these permissions. Everything after that is not something like virtual protect or virtual alloc. So I'm guessing then we can see here our memory area. We can also verify this as we look at the code though. Say we go to virtual, let me recheck. It should be in the imports now. Protect, it's not there, it's interesting. Maybe it's resolving them dynamically. So here's only one function at the entry point. Let's go there. Ah, and here we see create thread. And before that, there are calls of dynamically resolved functions. So I'm guessing this is our virtual protect call because we have here the very same parameters. And of course I could have just used this here to find it. Again, so figuring out the location where we find it is actually quite easy, it's here. And we can go there and then we see, okay, here's virtual protect call and then there's create thread using the same address that we also used for virtual protect. And before that is some decryption happening. So this might be what we want. So to dump our sample, we are gonna hook virtual protect. So we have the start address, the size of the memory area, the new protection constants, and the old protection constants. Now we want to hook specifically this instruction here, or this call, and not the one that's before.
before that. So before that, we have a different protection constant, which is just um, four, which I guess is something like read access. Let's look at this. Let's show protect. So here are the constants. You can see 20 is page execute read and four is just read write. So this isn't interesting because this does not contain code that we want to execute. So we will look for this one. Let's print all the params in case we get the right core. And now I'm going to write a function that will dump specifically the unpacked data. This should be enough to do that. And after that, we can stop the emulation. We don't have to do that, but it saves a little bit time. If it's not the new protection constant 20, we will just return zero for success. Let's look at this code. Firstly, the strings listing looks promising. However, it seems we did not get exactly the unpacked file here. So it starts with mz. The target file starts at offset 1700 in hex. And this is an emulator. So every execution will be the same. It is deterministic. We can just use this offset. So looking at the virtual protect call for the start address, if you subtract the base, it starts at 1000. So knowing that the target file starts at 1700, subtracting the base here, uh, we have an offset of 700 that we need to, need to add to the start address. And simultaneously, we have to reduce the size by the thing that we cut off at the beginning. Let's take a look at the result. And it's done. Now check our dump here. We don't have two PE files anymore, we have one. And it's our sample. Let's see if it works if we open this in a PE parser. It looks like it, but we do not see any import entries. And the reason that this didn't work before is because I forgot this and dump all memory call here. Because that one has overwritten my old dump that we made here. So let's remove that. Let's remove the whole thing. Save it and now we execute this again. Mm. 
And now we get the correct file. So the imports are intact. And let me see. That's our x32 dbg sample here. So debug path. Yeah. If you want to learn malware analysis from the ground up, please check the link in the video description below. It contains a coupon link to my Udemy course for beginners.